<clears throat> Before I start, I want to thank all of you for, for being in here. Also, I, I, want to, I want you to keep in mind that my case is not that all unique. It happens all the time, too many times. I'm the normal 99 person in the, in the nation to be exonerated and released from death row because the issues of innocence have been 127 already out. There's been 1,099 already executed, and only God knows the ones that not, did not have the luck that I had. <clears throat> Fui la víctima inocente de un proceso judicial que un momento crucial me sentenciaron a muerte. How many of you understood what I just say? No homies in the house? <laughs> Obviously nobody did. But just imagine yourself being arrested been in charge with first degree murder and I'm robbery. And in this case is the state of Florida sinking the death penalty against you, the electric chair, and you do not know the language. You're naive to the law. You lost in the courtroom. You see, they never gave me an interpreter. This is the type of English I know at that time. If I say five words in English, believe me, three of them will be cuss words. My name is Juan Roberto Melendez. I'm born in Brooklyn, New York, but I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. They took me back when I was just, just a little kid. And this is what I remember about the island. I remember going to, going to school barefooted because mama didn't have no money to buy us shoes. I remember that it was bare water and a lot of disease. And when you walk barefooted and you drink this bare water, uh, uh, you pick the disease. So a lot of my little brothers die. A lot of my little friends die. I survive. I guess I, I guess I always been a survivor. As I go around the country, and I've been this about every state in the United States, and above, been over twelve countries in, in Europe, been in Canada. I tell people my worst mistakes in life. My worst mistakes in life was when, when I stopped listening to my mama. When I stopped listening to the teachers. I started listening to these old people that gave me good advice and went to one ear, left the other one. I ain't paying attention. And it's one that I'm going to have to take to the grave. This is when I dropped out of school. Dropped out of school in the ninth grade. I became a man before time. I was calling sugar cane when I was 16 years old, 17. When I hit 18, I got tired of it. I decided to leave the island to make a better life for myself, sinking what they call the American dream. Unfortunately, instead, I leave the American nightmare. So I became what you call a fruit picker, a migrant worker. And that part of my life, I'm proud of it. Because uh, at least I'm earning the money the honest way. Out of all the great people and great men in this, in this world that have been in this world, like Martin Luther King, et cetera, et cetera, one of the greatest idols that I adore is Cesar Chavez. So anyway, I, I left the island and went to the state of Delaware. And they pick everything God created. And when we finished the season in there, I decided to go to the state of Florida to get the citrus fruit, the grapefruits, the orange, the lemons. And this is what I can tell you about Florida. I have walked on certain roads in my life, very dangerous roads, but never thought, never imagined, never crossed my mind that one day I will be convicted and sent to death for a crime I did not commit. This Odyssey in my life, this journey in my life, started in the month of February in 1984. That year, the city of Flu was hit by the frost, and all the grapefruits and oranges just fell down, and all we had to do was pick them up. So we was out of job in no time. So that forced me to migrate from the state of Florida all the way down in here to the state of Pennsylvania, in a town called Mechanicsville, near Harrisburg, where I knew a farmer named Mr. Miller that will hire me and give me a job pluming and trimming the apples and the peach trees. And then I'm ready for the next harvest. And I never forget this day. It was, it was a beautiful day. It was on a Monday, May the 2nd, 1984. Well, he was sitting at lunch on the uh, apple tree. Here come a whole bunch of ABI agents riding the cars. And they stopped in front of us. And they came out of the car with weapons in their hands. And they pointed at us. And they told us to hit the ground. And we did. Then they called my name, but I was scared to get up because of the weapons that was pointing at me. But I raised my arm. 
So they told me to get up and walk towel them, and I did. Then they told me to open my mouth. They want to see if I had a missing tooth. And I showed it to them. I still have it. Then they told me to lift the sleeves of the shirt of my, of my left arm. They want to see if I had a tattoo, and I showed it to them. Then they said, yes, you are the man we are looking for. You are warned for unlawful and fly to avoid prosecution with warrants for your arrest for first degree murder and I'm robbing the state of Florida. So they read me some, they read me some rights, slapped some handcuffs on me. And they told me in a police car. They took me to a federal prison. A week or so after that, they took me to court in front of a magistrate, a federal judge. And he was talking about extradition. But I did not know what extradition mean. I was naive to the law, naive to the language. So they brought in Tepet at that time to explain to me what is tradition me. And all he told me in Spanish was, you either wave it or fight it. They can take you back anyway. So I start thinking, I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. I would wave it. And as soon as they see my ugly face in Florida, they would let me go. But I thought how wrong I was. So I waved it tradition. They started me from the state of Pennsylvania all the way back to the state of Florida. A week or so after my arrival, they took me to court in front of a, of a judge. And he was reading the charges to me. You've been indicted, arrested for first degree murder, and armed robbery, and the state of Florida is sinking the death penalty against you, the electric share. A week or so after that, they took me right back to court with the same judge. This time to court upon a lawyer to me, a public defender. The truth is, I'm not OJ Simpson. I don't have money to hire lawyers. So this, this lawyer taps me in the back. And I cannot understand hardly what he's saying, because I did not know the language that well. They never gave me an interpreter. But he used to say, don't worry about it. You're going home. I did understood that going home stuff. I should go home. I did not commit this crime. So now we're going to trial. Monday, we start picking the jury. Tuesday, we're still picking jury. And after they pick 11 whites and one African-American person, a black man, no Hispanic, and I'm Hispanic. They read instruction to the jury how to conduct themselves in a capital murder case with the sinking, the death penalty. Wednesday, that's when the evidence come in. This is what they had against me. They had what they call a police informant, what they call in the streets a snitch. He claimed that I've confessed the crime to him. The same police informant, the same snitch. He also implicates another person in the crime. An African-American man, a black man, a friend of mine. That's what I thought. He gets arrested. He gets interrogated. He makes 15 statements. He incriminates himself in the crime. He gets charged with first degree murder, armed robbery, and detect him with the electric chair. So now it's time to make a deal. You see, prosecutors in the United States, they make deals with criminals. So he was able to strike a deal with the state. He gets, he gets his first degree murder charge drop. He gets his armed robbery charge drop. All the way to assess it after the fact. No more threats of the electric chair. He gets two years probation. With two years he already had. And he gets sentenced to them two years. After I'm convicted, I'm sentenced to death. And basically what he's saying trial was, I picked him up, took him to the scene of the crime, dropped him off, Came back a half and a half later, picked him up again, took him home, don't know what happened to after it happened. That's the entire evidence against me. No physical evidence. There's two questionable witnesses with a criminal record from here to California. Two questionable witnesses that make deals with the prosecutor, with the state, and get lenses for their own crimes they commit. This is, how, this is what I had on my favor, on the defense side. I have what you call an alibi witness. I have four witnesses corroborating the alibi testimony. I had other witnesses testifying, claiming that the police informant, the snitch, had a grunge against me. But I had a problem. Every witness that I had on my side was from the African-American race, a black man, a black woman. And when a black man and a black woman testify for the state, for the prosecutor, all of a sudden they got good credibility. They even dress them. But when a black man and a black woman testify, for the defense, on my side, all of a sudden the credibility is gone. Thursday, they found me guilty. 
This is the same week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, the same week. They sent me to death. And the judge complained that it was taking too long. When they sent me to death, my heart got full of hate. I became an angry man. I hated the prosecutor. I hated the judge. I hated the juror. And I hated that one that tapped me in the back. My trial defense lawyer. Because I felt he betrayed me. But overall, I thought we Puerto Rican men was real macho men. I found out different. I was scared. Very scared to die for a crime I did not commit. So now I'm going to death row. And this was an ugly day. I will never forget it. It was on a Tuesday, May, November the 2nd, 1984. The place was horrified. It was dark. It was cold. They keep me in a six by nine foot cell. And any time they move me out of that cell, for whatever reasons, I got shackles in my legs, change in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrist. The place was also infected with rats and roaches. So they took me down in the bottom floor. 13, 13, con condemned prisoners, 13 condemned prisoners to death in the bottom floor. Thir 17, 17 in the second, 17 in the third. And I made the, they made the 248 men condemned to death. So they registered the death penalty in the nation. In, in Florida, so they registered the death penalty in the nation in 1976. The fool, they put the fool in the car. And they will have car inside the door where you at, the floor where you at. And they place that tray, the, the, the tray of fool and the flap that you have in your cell door, like a big mail slot. And breakfast. That's the worst one. You see, they come real early, and they never wake you up. And if you wake, if you wait one, five seconds in your bone to get up and get that breakfast, forget about it. You ain't ran out of luck. You see, the roaches ain't beat you to it. They waiting for the breakfast too. And it get cold in Northern Florida. And the supply was with a thin blanket, and I cover myself from foot, face, and all. I don't want to see nothing. But the rats, they also get cold, and they want to get warm. So they climb that blanket. And I can feel that rat is running up and down. And I don't want to look at them. Because if I look at them, I'm not going to be able to sleep. But when that rat stays still in my chest, it's not moving. I get a good grip of the blanket. And I shake it hard as I can. And I can hit that, hear, hear that rat hit the floor. Boom! It's a big one. So I arrive over there on a Tuesday. Not that Thursday, the following Thursday. They executed the 10 person in the state of Florida. When I leave that place, 51, today 64, and still counting. But when they executed that 10 person, I got super scared. You see, I do not know the language that well. I, don't, I do not know the process. I'm naive to the law. I'm lost in there. So they toss in my mind. They're killing people here every week. How long is it going to be before they, they come and give me? So I know how to box. And I know all this exercise. You keep your muscle flexible. And you can defend yourself. So I'm thinking, if they come over here to get me, I'm not walking to that chair. The truth is, I'm scared of electricity anyway. So I had to come up with a plan. I take the sheets of my bunk, and I cut it all in pieces, and I make ropes with it. And I take these ropes, and I tie the cell door bars. You see, the cell door bars slide like this. I tie all this in. When they push the button in the control room, that door ain't moving nowhere. So, I'm thinking, by the time they cut these ropes off, I can give me a good warm up, and when they come and get me, I can defend myself. So now I got the, I got the doors all tied up, and it's around count time, they count almost every hour, and I'm doing exercise, I'm sweating good. I'm trying to get muscle come out of my eyebrows. You see, I'm trying to intimidate these people. I'm trying to scare them, but, but all the time, I'm the one intimidated, I'm the one scared. So now here comes the correction office, doing his round of count. And it's a big, tall African-American man, big black man. He had muscles in his eye, eyebrows. So he gets in front of my door. And when he see the doors all tied up, he gets angry. And he start cursing. Melendez, why he curse and curse and curse? And I do not know too much English, but I know how to curse. So I remind him of his mother, father, all the way down. So now me and this correction office, we discussing each other's out. And the rest of the condemned men to death. 
they got involved in the argument. But, but for, to my surprise, it's against me. They tell me that I'm wrong. So now I get angry with them. And I tell them the best way I can. I tell them, I know they're killing people here every week. And we ain't doing nothing. We're supposed to fight these people. We're supposed to burn the place down. We Puerto Ricans, we don't go out like that doing nothing. We fight. They still told me that I was a fool. They told me that I was crazy. They told me that all I do is get up in the morning and get in the cell door bars and nag and cry and curse about my innocence. They told me that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to speak English. Then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear at that time. They told me they would teach me. You see, the worst of the worst. The most in this arable and hated people in this nation. The one that some prosecutor called monsters taught this Puerto Rican how to write how to read, and how to speak English. Oh, it's rusty, but it helped me get by. You see, if they would never taught me, I would never survive. I would not be able to, to communicate better with my lawyers. I would not be able to learn law. I would not be able to reply the letters that so many pen pals wrote me. Some of them for this great state of Pennsylvania that showed me so much love, so much compassion, that make me feel like a human being. And today, I will not be able to share with all of you this sad story. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in Florida death row for a crime I did not commit. After 10 years, oh, I was tired of it. I went out of there. But the only way out is to commit suicide. And believe me, I said my friends committed suicide. And I'm going to tell you how they do it. They got what they call a runner. A runner is an inmate that's doing time in prison population that's not sentenced to death. And they get this runner out of prison population so he can do their work in the death row facilities. The truth is that the guards don't do too much. They just watch you and give you a hard time when they can. But this runner, this inmate that's not sentenced to death, he's the one that supplies us with the food, the toothbrush, the toothpaste, the mop and the broom so you can clean yourself. He also can supply you with a tool that you can take your life with, and he knows it. All you got to do is give him four stamps or a pack of cigarette rolled paper tobacco, the cheap kind, and he will give you this tool. Perhaps you do it because these items that are mentioned are more important to him than your life. Or perhaps you do it because he called himself assisting you. You see, he works there. He knows you want out of there. He know that their role is hell. The tube is real simple. It's a garbage plastic bag. The one you see in the garbage can, the strong kind. You give him four stamps, and he will swing that bag inside your cell. And you take that bag, and you twist it all up, and you make a rope. Then you put a noose in it. You put the noose in your neck, and you tie the other ends in the cell door bars. You throw yourself down. You dead, but you're free. That's what the demons used to tell me. Why? Why you got to go through all of this? You're supposed to be a Puerto Rican man, a real macho man. Why satisfy them? Why satisfy yourself? You say you didn't do it? You think they're going to believe you? They're going to kill you anyway. I start believing these thoughts. I never see my friends kill themselves because I cannot see through the walls. But I see when they wheel the body out. Something in the back of my head tells me, you're not gonna look at, my, at your friend for the last time. So I take a mirror that I have in my cell, and I grab it, and I stretch my arms to the bars. And this is what I see. I see a purple blue face that do not look like my friend. I get to see something else too. I get to see the noose at his neck because they never take it out. And that stay in my mind. So now, I want to take this trip. You see, I'm tired of it. I want out of there. I'm depressed. So I tell the runner, give me, give me that garbage bag. So I slide, I give him, give him four stamps. And I swing that garbage, garbage bag in, in my cell. And I take that bag, and I twist it all up, and I make a rope. 
then I put a noose in it. Then I look at it, and I look at my bunk, and I say to myself, I better lay down and think about this a little bit more. So I take that rope, and I throw it under the bunk, so when the guys walk by, they don't see it. And I lay down. When I lay down, I fall in a deep, deep, deep sleep. And I start dreaming that I'm a, I'm a little kid again, doing the things I used to do when I was a little kid. The things that make me smile. The things that make me happy. You see, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. But I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. When I get up in the morning and I look to the east side, it's a wonderful mountain. And if I walk six minutes to the south, I find myself in the most beautiful beach in the world. It is to me. So here I am, dreaming that I'm in the Caribbean Sea. The world is warm. The sun is bright, the sky is blue, the palm trees look so good. It's a beautiful day. Then I get to see something that I never seen before. Four dolphins coming my way. And a pair get in one side, and a pair get in another side, and they start flipping and jumping like dolphins do. I'm having a ball in there. I'm so happy. And then I look to the shore, and it's a lady waving at me, smiling at me, and she seems so happy. And I know why she is happy. She's happy because I'm happy. That's my dear mother. And then I wake up. When I wake up, the bones smell like a peach. So I take that, that rope that is made to take my life with. And I walk straight to the toilet with it. And I look at the toilet and I look at the rope. And I say real loud, I don't want to die. And I flush it. But the true fact is, it was lots and lots of beautiful dreams. Every time I got depressed, every time I wanted out of there, every time suicide thoughts came to my mind, our creator God sent me a beautiful dream. And I was wise enough to grab all these dreams as a sign of hope that one day I would be out of there, I would be free. That God was telling me, hey, I know you didn't do it, but I control the time. You get out. When I say you get out, you just got to trust me. When I analyze everything, I come to this conclusion. It took 17 years, eight months, and one day to also change the man. The death penalty. The death penalty is a law made by human beings and carried out by human beings. And we all know, we humans, we make mistakes. The death penalty is also a law that brings a lot of suffering, a lot of pain on both sides of the family on the family victim of homicide, and the family of the men and women that's condemned to death. Where family is concerned, this is all I had. Mama and five ends. Boy, I got brothers, I got sisters, I got uncles, I got lots of cousins. But they never wrote me a letter. Mama and five ends. I don't know how the ends are in this generation, but in my generation, when I was growing up, if I do something wrong and I get caught doing something wrong, believe me, it's gonna be a good spanking. And then I got to pray to God that she not tell mama. Because when she tell mama, it's gonna be another good spanking. But when I was hungry, my aunt feed me. When I needed a pair of pants, my aunt bought it for me. And in their role, they never forgot me. They wrote me lots and lots of letters. They sent me lots and lots of pictures of the one that born and I never seen. And I saw all them grow up to pictures. They love to keep the family together. And mama, I have to tell you, I believe she suffered more than anybody. She also wrote me lots and lots of letters. Lots of letters that gave me so much hope and helped me keep the will to live. But it's one letter that I keep with me all the time. When I'm down and out and sad and weak, I read it. And it always boosts me up. And it go like this. She wrote and say, son, I just built an altar. In that altar, I put the statue of the Virgin of the Guadalupe in it. And I cut roses and I put it in it. And I pray five rosaries a day. Sinking, searching, looking for a miracle son. And that miracle will come because I know you're innocent, and God knows that you're innocent, but you got to trust him. 
Put all your trust in him and hope in him. And he will send you free. 17 years, 8 months, and one day later, the miracle came through. Thank God for that. But in spite of all the other faith and hope that my mama had in God, she was saving the money to bring the body back to the island if Florida would have executed me. And no mother in this world should go to that pain. The conditions, very special the medical conditions. Oh, you better not get sick in death row. You see, they, they believe in, they, they love to use common sense. And the common sense is always against you. Why? Why give you, a person that's condemned to death, the best medication? When the, de when the, when the government can sign you death one today and kill you tomorrow. Why waste the best medication in a person that's condemned to death? In order for you to comprehend the condition and the type of people that work, that work in this, in this facility, I have to share with you, unfortunately, another sad story. We go to the yard four hours a week, two hours on a Monday, two hours on a Wednesday, Wednesday if it's not raining. They got a word that the weathermen use a lot when it's bad weather, and they use it inside too. In climate weather today, no, y'all, it's not one drop of rain falling. But this day we all went. All the ones that told me how to read, how to write, and how to speak English. But very particularly, this African-American person, this black man, I call them brothers. They all told me how to read and write and how to speak English. But this one in here, he was bushy. You need to learn this. You need to learn that. And I love him dear for that because I learned a lot from him. The brothers, they love to play basketball. Some of us, they play volleyball. I lift weights because I can burn steam and, and go back and rest in the cell a little bit better. So this brother of mine, he's, he's playing basketball. And all of a sudden, he falls to the ground. We stopped what we're doing. We all got concerned and went to check him out. When I got close to him, I noticed that white foam was coming out of his mouth and nose. So I assumed this got to be a stroke, a heart attack. So we tell the guards in the gate, you have a man down that need medical assistance. And they take the time with a walkie-talkie. They call the clinic. Here comes the so-called nurse. It's a tall white man with a big, great belly. And they let him inside the gate. And they told us in the yard to put our back to the fence. And from the gun towers, they point machine guns at us. And you better not move. They will shoot you. So now, now they let the, the so-called nurse inside the yard. And I noticed that he had no medical bag. But he had something. He had about a half a pound of shooting tobacco in his mouth. And everyone said, well, you can see the black stove is running on the side. And everyone said, well, he specs. He is in the yard now. And he's a brother in the ground. So we tell him, he's not breathing. He need air. He say, I got to go back to the clinic and get an accent there. And he specs. So he walks real slow back to the clinic. And come back walking real slow back to the yard. He gets inside the yard and bends down and puts the oxygen tank in my friend's mouth. Then he gets off the nurse. And we tell him, he's still not breathing. He needs air. So he holds the oxygen tank like this. And he say, I got to go back again to the clinic and get another oxygen tank. This one in here is not working. And he spits. And I tell him, you don't have to. You can do CPR mouth to mouth. But tell him one of them to do mouth to mouth to a brother in the ground. You're wasting your time. So he looks up, and then he looks down. And he made a statement using these two racist words, the M and the N, and I'm not going to put my mouth in there. I said, you don't have to. I do it. You just do the counting. And he agreed. I'm so glad he agreed. You see, I'm trying to save my friend's life. So I rushed down there, and I took my T-shirt off, and I wiped that white phone my friend had in his mouth and nose. And he stopped counting. One, two, three, and I blow air. One, two, three, and I blow air again. One, two, three, and I blow air. My friend opened his eyes. So glad he opened his eyes. I see a silent hope. He's going to live. But all of a sudden, his eyes rolled back. And then he made a frown with his face and mouth that I can see it right now because he never left me. Then he breathed real hard and, and air came out. I think that was his soul that left him because he died right in my arms. So now I'm angry. 
And I want to do something so-called nurse that let my friend die in the yard like a dog. When I was finna swing at him, here come the rest of the condemned men and snatch me out of there. Throw me in a corner. And they told me, Puerto Rican Johnny, don't get it no more throw you already out of here. We got other ways to handle this. I still go to confinement for 90 days for the respecting a member of the staff, whatever that means. When I learned a lesson, I learned I had to trust and sing and look for something more powerful than the system. And the only thing I could see that's more powerful than the system is our creator, God. And the truth is that, that they condemn women or men to death that don't grab something spiritual, either go crazy or commit suicide. Some of them become Muslims and they praise Allah and they teach others how they read, how they write, how they speak English, how they respect. Some of them become Buddhists. Frankly, I don't know what they praise, but they teach others how they love, how they have compassion, how they forgive. Some of them become Christians. That's what I did. I had to go back to my roots and remember everything my mama told me about Jesus Christ, Virgin Mary, and the Holy Ghost. They threw it, she's Catholic to the bones. And this is my personal opinion, only mine. I believe that we're serving the same God with different names. The all we got to do in this world to go to heaven is just make good choices in life and do good deeds. And we never have no problem going to heaven. This friend of mine that the state of Florida let him die in the yard like a dog. One month after his death, he wins a new trial. But the state of Florida let my friend die in the yard like a dog. The state of Florida denied my friend his right to prove his innocence. So you know about the suicides. And you know about the conditions and the type of people that, that run these facilities. Let me tell you the worst. The worst is when the government kill, when they execute someone. You see, here I am in this cell, and next, and next to me is another man condemned to death. There I know for 10 or 15 years. He cries in my shoulder. I cry in his. He shared with me his most deeper thoughts. I share mine with him. I learned to grow up to love him. He become more than family to me. And then one day they snatch him over there, out of the cell, and I know what's gonna happen. They're gonna kill him, and I cannot stop it. And my time is the electric chair. And they got to generate the chair with electricity. And I can hear this boozy sound. Uh, uh, uh. I still stay in my mind. And I know precisely the time they're burning the life out of him because the lights go on and off and I still can stop it. And believe me, some of them are innocent like Jesse Tefaro, Benny Dens, Leo Jones, Pedro Medina. And I still can stop it. And the pain don't stop here. After I'm out, you see, they have securing the ones that I know in Florida, like the last one they executed, through lethal ingestion, a process that's supposed to take only less than 10 minutes. It takes 36. They torture him, and he was innocent. My homeboy, Angel Nieves Diaz, they offered offer him five years, and he did not took it. He did not commit this crime. But I know of his sad stories. Let me tell you how I got out of there. And I will tell you right from the jump, I was not saved by the system. I was saved in spite of the system. I was saved by the grace of God, by miracle. Here comes my attorney. And he said, Melendez, you have lost too many appeals. I said, tell me something new. Then he said, but we're going to try one more time. But, but if you lose this one, you'll be lucky if you live three years. I say, no. If I lose this one, I'll be lucky if I live a year and a half. You know who the governor of Florida is, of Jeff Bush. He would have no problem in signing it. So the strategy was to send the investigator out to see my child defense lawyer. Remember the one who used to pat me in the back and the first miracle occurred. My child defense lawyer becomes a judge. And I'm so glad he became a judge. You see, by him becoming a judge, he creates what they call in the legal world a conflict of interest. And that conflict of interest gave me the opportunity to move my case out of that racist county, 
Out of the county where they fabricated the case against me. Out of the county where the good old boy network operates. And it moves from Balto, Port County, Florida. And by the way, don't go over there. It moves to Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida. And it falls in the hands, in the hands of a corrosious woman that wants to do the right thing. A female judge that go by the name, Honorable Barbara Fletcher. I can sincerely say I owe her my life. So going back to the story, when my investigator go and see my trial defense lawyer, the one that used to pat me in the back, she tell, uh, he tells her, I'm a judge now. I have a new office. But in the old office where I used to do my defense work, I believe it's a box in there with the name Melendez running on it. You can go in there and have it. So she rushed over there and she grabbed that box and she took that box to her office and played it. Guess what? The confession, I found a tape cassette and played it. The confession of the real killer was in that tape cassette. And my trial defense lawyer had it one month before trial. So now this open a can of wounds now. The case is in the hands of a colossal woman that wants to do the right thing. After she heard the take confession of the real killer, she immediately made a court order to the prosecution office, the one that prosecuted me, and the man that he sent any files, any documents of my case, if he, if he had any. And he did. Guess what? He had a copy, a transcript of the take confession of the real killer. And he also had it one month before trial. But he had something else too. He had 16 documents that corroborated the take confession of the real killer. 16 documents that he never turned into child defense lawyer at the time of the trial. What creates in the legal world a Brady Rule violation will hold an escapatory evidence. Prosecutor misconduct. By that time, I already had three eventuality hearings. And I was able to establish more than 20 witnesses that also came further and testified, including the wife and sister of the real killer, including law enforcement officers, including a former prosecutor investigator, a former FBI agent, criminal lawyers, friends of the real killer. In the end, even found physical evidence against the real killer. The real killer was also a police informant. So now, one of Barbara Fletcher got all this ammunition, and she decided to write a 72-page opinion on it. In the 72 page opinion, she chastised the prosecutor for the way he handled the case. She chastised law enforcement officer for the way they investigated the case. And she chastised them in the pat in the back for the way he called himself defending me. And she ordered a new trial. And she let her know that the case was terrible damage. That everything in the case, you have an innocent man in that role. The prosecutor decided not to process the case, drop the case, dismiss the case. And that's why I'm here, thank God, talking to all you now. I never know. The time and date they was going to release it, it caught me totally by surprise. They put shackles in my legs, chains in my waist, handcuffs in my wrist, and they took me to a place they called the information room, not too far for the dependent, the rope, yes. They sent me in a chair. Behind, behind, in front of me is a desk. Behind the desk is a lady working on computers, and she was making some funny questions. She asked me for my social security number. And I wonder why she wanted to know my social security number. But I know about her, I give it to her. Then she came with some more crazy questions. Where are you working at? Who are you working with? What job do you, what type of job do you have? And I almost gave her a real look. Because she got up on the chair she was sitting on. And put both hands in the desk that was in front of me. And looked straight at my eyes. And she said, Melendez, you do not understand what's going on in here, do you? I say, lady, I, I, just, I don't have the size idea. I live across the streets. I've been in there for almost 18 years. I'm in their row. They don't have no jobs in their row. So then she say, she say, Melendez, we are fixing, we are doing your paperwork. They are going to release you today. And I do not know if you watch cartoons. And you see this cartoon corridor. He takes a slow hammer. And he's the other one inside the head with it. And you can see that now this comes straight up. And then he got a ring, a star that's going around his neck, his head. And he's in a state of shock, but he's smiling. That's how I was. <laughs> in a state of shock, but smiling. And I'm still smiling today. And then the correction officer, they start acting different. 
Yo, for me sandwich and soda pops. I say, I don't want no sandwich. I don't want no soda pop. I just want to go back to my cell, pack everything up, and get out of here. And I never see these people work so fast. I mean, this pushing everybody out of the way because I had to take physicals and sign papers. And I was first for everything. Then the correction officer started calling me something they never called me before. They start calling me Mr. Melendez. And I liked that. So now I pack everything in my cell. And I finna go, get out of my cell. But I wanna say goodbye to the man in the last cell. And I'm in the cell next to last. They all, they all know I was finna leave. And when I got out of that cell, I got tears running down my cheeks. I got a smile in my face. But I cannot say nothing to him. I got in front of him and I cannot say nothing. Because I was happy, but part of me still was sad. Because I'm leaving them behind. They want to tell me how to read, how to write, and how to speak English. And if we don't abolish the death penalty, I know they're going to kill them all. But he was able to talk. He had tears running down his cheeks and a smile on his face, but he was able to say something. And this was his sad words. First word that came out of his mouth was, don't get, don't get in no trouble there. Then he say, take care of yourself. Then he say, don't forget about us. And his last word was, take care of your mama. They all know my mama. This person that told me these last words, his name is, his name is Clarence Hill. He changed his name to Rashad because he became a Muslim. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that in 2005, September the 20, he was executed. May his soul rest in peace. So this about every one of them was telling me the same thing. And before I get to that door that gonna lead me out of that floor, out of that wing, I hear a clap, then I hear a second clap, and a third clap, and a whole bunch of claps. They was making so much noise by whistling and hollering and clapping hands that the correction officer got angry with them and told them to shut up, to be quiet. They stopped making noise to I left that place. They was real glad to see me go. So now I'm the door that gonna lead me to freedom. And when they opened this door, this is what I saw. I saw a whole bunch of reporters. CNN, ABC, the Association Press, everybody was in there. And no offense, but, but reporters sometimes make some silly questions. The first one was, how do you feel? <laughs> and I tell them how I feel. I feel good. I'm going home. I'm going to feed my mama. Then come this female reporter with some more crazy questions. Where are you going? What you want to do? What you want to see? I did not tell her that I want to go to Disney World. I told her and it came naturally. It came from my heart. And they wrote it down just like I told her. I told her that I want to see the moon. I want to see the stars. I want to walk on grass, on dirt. I want to hold a little baby mom and play with him. Of course I told her. I want to talk to some beautiful women. That reporter had in front of me. She was ugly. Well, that's a joke. I miss the things that we take for granted, the simple things in life. I'm a type of man today that I can sit on a rock and, and look at a mountain for hours and hours, enjoy every bit of it, and don't get bored. I cannot understand the people in the free world when they tell me they, they're bored. When so many good, great things God created for us that we can enjoy, love, and take care. When so many good deeds and good choices we can make in life. And speaking about good deeds and good choices, I have a confession to make. I'm still a dreamer. I dream every day, and I pray to God every day that in my time, I can see the death penalty abolished. But this dream cannot come true before you don't get involved. See, you are part of my dream now. See, the problem with the death penalty is, it's all about details, about the education. We got to educate ourselves and educate others. You see, people need to know that it's cruel and unnecessary, that we had alternatives. People need to know that they do not deter crime. People need to know that it costs too much. People need to know that it's racist. People need to know that alone, as, as the state of Pennsylvania had it, or any nation or country that had it, it always will be a risk to execute an innocent one. You see, you always can release an innocent man 
from prison. But you can never, and I repeat, you can never release an innocent man from the grave. So let's stop this madness. And it's like we got rid of segregation. And we got rid of slavery. All united together, we can get rid of, of the death penalty. People need to learn and know that it's a bad government policy. It don't resolve no problem in society. And believe me, we already got blood in our hands. They have killed some innocent people. Don't let the government fool you with that. God bless you and peace and love to you all. Thank you, Mr. Melendez. <laughs> no, no. Well, you're going to know. <laughs>